This is part 13 of my video series entitled, The Greatest Doctrines of the Bible. Tonight's lesson is called, What's Wrong with the Roman Catholic Church? My entire series is about the greatest doctrines of the Bible, speaking of the oneness of God and the new birth. So, why on earth am I on this subject? And why am I taking the time to ask this question, what's wrong with the Roman Catholic Church? Well, here's why. The Roman Catholic Church is enemy number one of the greatest doctrines of the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church is the most vehement opponent on this earth to the great doctrines of the oneness of God and the new birth. More than 1.25 billion people follow the Catholic errors. Therefore, I intend to both expose and soundly condemn it for the very same reasons that all wars are waged. Wars are waged because hostile enemies threaten to destroy things that are near, dear, and precious to us. Jesus said, If I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come to you. Luke 11:20. So why did Jesus say that? At that moment, Jesus was talking about casting out devils and destroying the works of the devil. He said, if I cast out devils, the kingdom of God comes. I want you to think about that. The only thing that prevents the kingdom of God from having 100% occupancy in this world is sin and Satan. Where Satan has dominion, the kingdom of God has been illegally displaced. When Bible truth ousts Satan and his lies, then the kingdom of God instantly returns to fill the void. Until the serpent beguiled Adam and Eve in the garden, they lived in a perfect paradise. From the moment Adam and Eve embraced Satan's first lie, their paradise was lost. Nothing could have been more offensive to God he had warned Adam that in the day he disobeyed, he would surely die. Death itself is the penalty for disobedience to God's word. But disobedience was their reaction to Satan's lies. Consequently, God cast out their sin, he cast out the sinners, and he cast out Satan. He put angelic cherubims with a flaming sword at the entrance to the garden to keep the way of the tree of life. So God hates the false teachings of Satan. Truth and lies are incompatible. Truth and lies cannot share the same stage. Truth will not sleep in the same bed with a lie. Either lies will prevail or truth will prevail. And we know very well what God's position is on that matter. Truth will always eventually triumph, either when men and angels take sides with God and submit to the truth, or when God destroys men and angels for their failure to side with the truth, and he sovereignly reinstalls the truth. As long as men and angels give place to lies, spiritual war is necessary and inevitable. Spiritual war will continue to be raged until Jesus Christ returns at Armageddon to utterly destroy all lies and liars. But in the interim, it is the business of the true church of Jesus Christ to wage war against every lie and every devil. And that reality specifically calls the Roman Catholic Church back into this discussion. The only way we can build a true church is to denounce and overthrow sin and Satan, condemn lies and the liars who tell them, and plead unreservedly, unabashedly, and stalwartly for the truth. Salvation comes when lies die, and truth is back where it should be. Paul said in Galatians, There be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. That's in Galatians 1, 7 through 9. John the Baptist was sent from God to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. That meant that John came to denounce sin and Satan and to sanctify a pure place for Jesus Christ to be revealed. John mercilessly rebuked and castigated the Pharisees of his day and the false religionists and pointed them to Christ. When Jesus came on the scene, he joins John in that warfare and denounced the lies and declared the truth. When Jesus Christ cursed the fig tree until it wilted and died in Matthew 21, there was a much greater conflict taking place than most people realize. The Bible said when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon the fig tree withered away. That's in Matthew 21, 19. Jesus' cursing of the fig tree was symbolic, allegorically and typologically, of cursing the Jews themselves for their spiritual apostasy, for their heresies, and for their fruitlessness. The prophet Jeremiah had likened Israel in his day to figs and fig trees. Jeremiah spoke in terms of very good figs, first ripe, and very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. That's in Jeremiah 24 and 2. That allegory about the figs branded good and godly Jews as good figs and wicked sinful Jews as naughty figs. Subsequently, Jesus' treatment of the fig tree was an epic object lesson in which he subtly but prophetically handed down his judgment and his condemnation on Israel because of their spiritual apostasy, their heresies, and their fruitlessness. Their fruitlessness was largely the consequence of the Pharisees and their other Jewish leaders' false unbiblical beliefs and practices. Israel had become the fruitless fig tree. It had become worthless to Jesus, useless to him. So he sentenced it to die. Later that same day, the disciples found the fig tree withered to the ground. It was dead. But that was not the end of the matter. Jesus' cursing of the fig tree spoke to an even much larger matter, and that was the watershed condemnation of Phariseeism and all their other false religionists in Israel. The final blow came when Jesus cursed the holy temple itself and decreed that every stone of that temple would be thrown down. The Bible said his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's in Matthew 24, 1 and 2. That was no arbitrary prophecy where Jesus randomly decided to destroy the temple for senseless reasons. Jesus very intentionally prophesied the destruction of the temple to destroy the wretched pharisaical religion that had illegitimately usurped and taken over Israel in the house of God itself. Which brings me to this point. God will invariably destroy all false religion. You need to get that. God will invariably destroy all false religion. And that's why my subject is what it is today. You have to put that somewhere in all of your lessons learned. God will destroy every false religion. In my prophecy book, the Daniel Prophecies, God's Plan for the Last Days, I made an absolutely voluminous case that clearly identified the Roman Catholic Church as Mystery Babylon in Revelation 16, 17, and 18. You do very well to take out your Bible and carefully read all three of those chapters in the book of Revelation on this subject. Revelation 16 to 18. Nowhere in the Bible is there a more scathing condemnation of any false religion than what John called the judgment of the great whore in Revelation 17.1. In this 
lesson today, I will show you as briefly and concisely as I can that the Roman Catholic Church is not, it is not a true Christian church, but it is indeed the great whore, the mother of harlots and abominations in the earth that John spoke of. It is Mystery Babylon that God has vowed to soon cast down and destroy violently before Jesus Christ returns to this earth. According to the prophecies of the Bible, the wrath of Almighty God is very soon going to be poured out on this great whore, this Roman Catholic Church. John said, A mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon, speaking of Rome, shall be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and the voice of musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. That's Revelation 18, 21 to 24. When he said, thus with violence, he was saying like an angel casting a great millstone into the sea, God will soon violently destroy Rome. And that includes the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to remember this. Rome killed Jesus. Rome killed Peter. Rome killed Paul. Rome killed millions of early church saints. Rome destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Rome ransacked the holy temple in Jerusalem under Titus and carried away all the holy furnishings of the holy temple. They built the Colosseum in Rome with the wealth of Israel's holy temple and the labor of 12,000 Jewish slaves. Rome sent Christians to the lions in its public places. Rome supplanted the early church with its Trinitarian heresy and a host of other false doctrines. Rome silenced the truth of God's word with a Christianized version of Babylon and other mystical pagan and mythical doctrines to form what we now know as the evil, despotic Roman Catholic Church, which led inquisitions and crusades and other wars and barbarisms, killing over 100 million innocent souls in the past 1,700 years. The prophets of Israel foresaw cataclysmic future events pertaining to the Roman Catholic Church. They could not have been darker or bleaker. Revelation 11:13 describes a violent earthquake that will occur immediately before Jesus Christ returns with his saints and angels to wage the great and final battle of Armageddon. The Bible said it's going to destroy a tenth part of the city of Jerusalem at the moment when the two witnesses are resurrected, simultaneous with the resurrection and rapture of the saints of all the ages, including the living church. But at the time of that earthquake, this violent earthquake, its epicenter is going to be in Rome. It's going to shake the whole earth. And that will be the seventh vial of the seven vials of God's wrath. The Bible said in Revelation, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple from heaven, from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. The great city, speaking of Rome, was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. 
And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, which is fifty or sixty pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. That's according to Revelation 16, verses 17 to 21. So 60-pound hail is going to fall on the wicked during the seventh vial of God's wrath, and this destruction of Rome will be the last event of the seven years before Jesus, who was spoken of in Daniel's prophecy as the stone hewn without hands out of a mountain, will appear and will smite the kingdoms of men. You remember that stone that smote the feet of Nebuchadnezzar's image? Daniel said, a stone, speaking of Jesus Christ, was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 5. But I want you to get the real meaning of what I've just read to you. I have just shown from the scriptures the violent wrath of God being manifest prior to the coming of Jesus Christ to earth to utterly and mercilessly destroy Rome and the Roman Catholic Church. You need to comprehend what I'm telling you. This is a true and reliable picture of exactly how God feels about the Roman Catholic Church and all of its abominations and heresies, not the least of which is her lying Trinitarian doctrine about God. I'm going to show you several examples of the Catholic Church's countless heresies in just a few moments. But I want you to recognize the fact that God destroys false religion. Don't ever forget that. It is an unwavering divine attitude toward lying, heresy, false religion, and those who perpetrate it. So the church, the true church, must align itself with God's attitudes. If God loves something, we should love it. If God hates something, we should hate it. You and I really have no other choice lest we find ourselves in dangerous conflict and disagreement with God himself. If we protect and preserve things that God hates, then we will eventually be destroyed with them. But if we reject and renounce the things that God hates, we will find ourselves in his favor when judgment is finally meted out on that matter. Therefore, if we will ever fulfill the great commission of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, we must drive back the forces of darkness as we do. And we must shine the light of truth where darkness has prevailed. For that reason, I'm including several examples here that both expose the works of Satan and intentionally discredit and disable his evil influence. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's John 8, 32. We only handicap and hinder ourselves when we accommodate lies and we accommodate heresies that wage endless war against the truth. It is impossible for us to know all the truth until we have systematically and thoroughly identified and rejected all the lies that have heretofore influenced us and misled us. We have to put away the lies before we can know the full truth. Only when we have driven out all the lies and the deceptions can we then begin to comprehend the fullness and greatness of all truth in its magnificent glory. As long as you and I entertain and give place to errors and heresies, then we enable the powers of hell to silence truth in some measure. I cannot, I must not, I will not allow that to happen. With God's help, I will expose every enemy of God and incapacitate that enemy to the best of my ability. Therefore, I purposely and intentionally 
expose the Roman Catholic Church and its pervasive evil influence on the true gospel and the true church of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that despite its meticulously crafted universal reputation, Roman Catholicism is not true Christianity in any biblical term. Roman Catholicism is the apex of paganism, and I'm going to demonstrate why I say that. Those who are sympathetic to the Catholic mindset will quickly accuse me of mindless Catholic bashing. But before answering that charge, I'm going to tell you that the gospel itself, above all else, the true church of Jesus Christ exists to preach the truth of God's holy word from Genesis to Revelation. The true church must take full responsibility for its role as the guardian and sacred custodian of truth, biblical truth. Therefore, if history shows that the Roman Catholic Church has faithfully defended the pure and unadulterated Word of God and has faithfully defended the true gospel of Jesus Christ, including the doctrine of the new birth experience as it was preached and practiced by Jesus and his apostles and the first century church in John 3 and Acts 2, then I will fervently defend it. But if on the other hand we find out that a mountain of evidence that the Roman Catholic Church has in fact worked viciously against true biblical Christianity, such as appeared in the original first century church, then we should not only denounce it, but also do everything in our power to persuade everyone under its seductive influence to instantly free themselves from it. Is the Roman Catholic Church the mother church that Jesus founded? Most people don't have a clue about the true origin and history of the Roman Catholic Church. If the whole world knew all the facts, the Roman Catholic Church would already be out of business. The Roman Catholic Church only exists by spectacular deception and subterfuge. On the surface, it grandly poses as the sanctimonious descendant and rightful heir of the original church. It is visually impressive with all of its pomp and splendor and its inestimable wealth and its global political power which cannot be rivaled by any other force on earth. But a close inspection of the Catholic Church reveals a secretive, scheming, diabolical, murderous, despotic, totalitarian-minded organization with nothing less than world dominion and world control on its mind. Its catechism does not clearly teach that Jesus will come back to rule the world, but instead it plans for its popes to rule the world for the ages to come. The Catholic Church has almost nothing at all of any legitimacy in common with the original church of Jesus Christ that was born in the upper room on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts of the Apostles. I'm telling you, Catholicism is not authentic at all. It's not based on the Bible. The very foundation upon which Roman Catholicism was built is a grave heresy that's twisted from Matthew 16, 18, and 19. In those verses, Jesus said to Peter, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Catholic Church claims that Peter was the rock upon which the church is built. Therefore, by claiming an unbroken, although spurious line of apostolic succession, as it calls it, tracing from Peter to the current pope, they claim that every subsequent pope is built on the rock, Peter, and that he then becomes the rock upon which the church is built. In that official Catholic view, the current pope, Pope Francis, is now considered the rock upon which the church is built. It's an unbelievably exorbitant bronze and gold statue in the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica. It's called St. Peter's Chair. That is an entire farce, and it's utter blasphemy, and it was designed to completely dupe the public and hijack the original true church for its Roman exploitation. It's called the Chair of St. Peter the chair of St. Peter, and it's a blasphemy. Jesus is the rock, not Peter. 
Peter would certainly widely disown and disavow this whole scam. To be clear, the rock Jesus referred to was the glorious truth that Peter had just confessed two verses earlier where he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the doctrine of Christ. It's the doctrine of God in Christ. That's the doctrine of the oneness of God, an eternal spirit dwelling in the body of a man, born of a woman, the only begotten Son in whom the fullness of God dwells. It's the doctrine of Christ, and that is the rock upon which the true church is built. Not Peter. The oneness doctrine is the rock. Jesus himself, Emmanuel, God with us, is the rock. The claim that each one of the subsequent 265 so-called popes was or is the rock is profoundly antichrist. It is profoundly antichrist. Do you hear me? There is no better example of antichrist. But that one single heresy is nothing but the opening salvo of a 2,000-year-old global warfare against the truth of the Bible. Their long list of false claims against the truth of Christ includes outrageous papal titles. Listen to this, such as Pope Leo's claim in, in 451 AD when he called himself the Lord of the whole church. Do you think the Pope is the Lord of the whole church? Of course not. That's blasphemy. Tertullian in the early 3rd century said that the Holy Spirit was the vicar of Christ. He claimed the Holy Ghost was the stand-in for Jesus. We know better. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. There is no difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Ghost. And, the, and when Christ is here in the form of the Holy Ghost, Christ is here. But when Pope Galatius the first in 495 AD began to teach papal primacy, the Catholic teaching of papal primacy, or also called papal supremacy, that the Pope was the absolute authority over all churches. That's where the title Vicar of Christ was given to the Pope. Since that time in 495 AD, the official Catholic doctrine affirms that the Pope is the stand-in for Christ. Jesus doesn't rule the Catholic Church because the Pope stands in for him. The Pope is their infallible ruler of the Roman Catholic Church. Those papal claims are almost identical to Lucifer's claims in Isaiah 14, where he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'll be like the Most High. The Pope's doing exactly what Lucifer said he was going to do. In the 8th century, the papal crown was introduced. It's a triple tiara, a triple crown, symbolically representing dominion over all earthly realms, spiritual and temporal. For over a thousand years, each pope of the Roman Catholic Church was crowned with the triple tiara crown and was styled, quote, the father of princes and kings, ruler of the world on earth, and vicarious Christ. Think about those three titles. Is the Pope really the father of kings? Isn't God in heaven the father of kings? As a crown's royalty, the Pope placing the crown on hundreds of other emperors and royalty throughout the centuries. The Pope took on himself the role of the king of kings. Isn't that blasphemous? Yes, it is. Secondly, is the Pope really the ruler of the world? Whether or not you believe he is, the Roman Catholic Church officially believes that. The Pope is the ruler of the world according to the Roman Catholic Church. Thirdly, is the Pope vicarious Christ? Does he replace Christ? Absolutely not. Yet the Roman Catholic Church absolutely believes that he is and he does. The Pope, also called the Holy See, is officially the king of the sovereign monarchy of the Vatican State. But for over a thousand years, the Pope has empowered the kings of Europe by presiding over their coronations. And today, the Pope is the only international religious leader who regularly addresses the entire General Assembly at the United Nations or who holds official observer status at the United Nations. Lucifer himself, using the office of the Holy See, has finally, yet temporarily, exalted his throne in the earth in the form of the Roman Catholic Church and its Pope. 
But you make no mistake about it, friend. This throne is going to be cast down. John the Revelator prophesied that in the last days, a 10-king European world government beast will ultimately turn violently against the Roman Catholic Church and destroy it. Listen to what this verse says. These shall hate the whore, speaking of the 10 horns, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That's Revelation 17, 16 in the same chapter where he speaks of the judgment of the great whore. Neither Peter nor any other apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, or evangelist in the first 150 years of the early church ever claimed to have the kind of sovereign authority that modern popes claim to have. Peter didn't claim those powers. If you study the Roman Catholic Church long enough and hard enough, you're going to finally come to the conclusion that the entire operation is in fact a collusion. It's a vast global conspiracy of part atheism and part Luciferian power brokers. And as such, it is a vicious ravening wolf in sheep's clothing, fully intent on hijacking the real gospel of Jesus Christ for the purpose of building a temporal worldwide kingdom under its own rule. I've heavily documented and corroborated all these claims in my 726-page book, The Daniel Prophecies, God's Plan for the Last Days. And I wish you'd refer to that work when you get a chance. Go to Amazon and get that book, The Daniel Prophecies. Consider these blasphemous claims made by the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Benedict XIII, in proclaiming the Catholic Jubilee of 1725, made the most blasphemous claims about the Roman Catholic Church and its host city of Rome. He said of Rome and the Catholic Church, listen, to this holy city, famous for the memory of so many holy martyrs, run with religious alacrity, hasten to the place which the Lord hath chose. Ascend to this new Jerusalem, whence the law of the Lord and the light of evangelical truth had flowed forth into all nations. From the very beginning of the church, the city most rightfully called the palace. He's talking about Rome. Place for the pride of all ages, the city of the Lord. He's talking about Rome. The Zion of the Holy One of Israel. This Catholic and apostolical Roman church is the head of the world. The mother of all believers, the faithful interpreter of God and mistresses of all churches. That's more than audacious. It's outrageous heresy. And that heretical proclamation by the Pope of Rome claimed that Rome is, listen, he called it the New Jerusalem, the palace place for the pride of all ages, the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, the head of the world, the mother of all believers, the faithful interpreter of God, and the mistress of all churches. Every single title on that list is a flagrant heresy, if not outright blasphemy. And because of its enormous influence in the world today, the Catholic Church should have to answer to the most piercing biblical scrutiny and the most brutal questioning to verify or prove its authenticity. Now, if the Catholic Church could pass all this unfettered biblical scrutiny, then we should have no doubts about it, and we should all join it. But if we thoroughly investigate the Catholic Church and discover that in its present form, it is almost completely alien to the biblical description and teachings of the true New Testament church, then we should pull the wool off of it and show the whole world what a rabid wolf it actually is. How did the Roman Catholic Church come into existence? The founding of the Roman Church cannot be understood without understanding its root in the ancient Roman Empire. It was the Emperor Constantine of Rome, who was a terrifying adversary of the early church Christians, who played a major role in the founding and establishment of the Roman Catholic Church. That fact by itself should trigger every alarm. It should cause us to ask probing questions about how this movement really became what it is today. The Catholic Church would have you totally forget that the real New Testament church was born in Jerusalem, not in Rome. Was Roman Caesar Constantine a true disciple of the true religion of Jesus Christ and of the original apostles? Or did Constantine perpetrate a gross deception? 
We should take a look at several of the most fundamental doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church and decide whether this so-called church is genuinely built on the teachings and practices of the true rock, Jesus Christ, or is it built on a mountain of blasphemous heresies? Any doctrine that clearly contradicts the Bible is a heresy. Do you believe that? Any doctrine that clearly contradicts the Bible is a heresy. And so not surprisingly, the Catholic Church does not define heresy in those terms. That's not what the Catholic Church says heresy is. The Catholic Church doesn't say that if you contradict the Bible, you're a heretic. It says if you contradict the Catholic Church, you're a heretic. It claims that anything that contradicts the catechism is heresy. The Catholic Encyclopedia defines heresy thus. It says the believer accepts the whole deposit as proposed by the church. The heretic accepts only such parts of it as commend themselves to his own approval. The heretical tenets may be ignorance of the true creed, erroneous judgment, imperfect apprehension, and comprehension of dogmas. They never even mentioned the Bible. The Pope and the Roman Catholic Church have taken to themselves all power and authority to interpret, apply, and enforce the scriptures. Anyone who subsequently disagrees with the Catholic Church is a heretic and will ultimately face both excommunication and anathemas, that is, curses. But the Catholic Church itself has institutionalized and propagated scores of its own deadly fundamental doctrines that are not merely unbiblical, but they are flagrantly devious and subversive of the true gospel of Jesus Christ and of the true New Testament oneness, apostolic, Pentecostal, holiness, church. To preach and practice such vile Catholic doctrines is to contradict and countermand so many sacred and infallible truths of the Bible, to be a heretic in the truest sense of the word, and to ultimately be a partaker of the judge, on judgment day of its evil deeds, according to 2 John 1.11. One of the biggest reasons why the Roman Catholic Church is able to get away with all of her diabolical teachings in modern times is that virtually all, though not all, Christian churches of all kinds have their oldest roots in the Roman Catholic Church. Although the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century led to the breakaway of multitudes of preachers and believers, the Reformation did not thoroughly renounce or sever its ties with so many of the Catholic heresies and practices. Above all else, Protestantism never renounced the evil doctrine of the Trinity, and because of that, many of the chief Roman Catholic heresies persist even in Protestantism. Those groups continue to hold Catholic errors, and they are what John the Revelator called her harlot daughters. Listen to what the Bible says. Upon her forehead was a name written, the mother of harlots, Revelation 17:5. Our society has become so accustomed to the Roman Catholic Church's false definition of Christianity that the Bible and God himself have almost no power of persuasion over this generation. But in earlier centuries, these lies were not so prevalent. They were not so universal. They had to be foisted on the public by force. They were foisted on the public by threatenings by confiscations, by excommunications, by abuses, and even by murders. I want to show you a partial list of several gross heresies of the Catholic Church. The first is transubstantiation. This Catholic heresy teaches that the communion bread becomes another substance by transubstantiation. It is changed miraculously, they say, into the literal body of Christ. Likewise, the communion wine, they say, is miraculously changed into the literal blood of Jesus. According to the Catholic Church, no one can be saved. Are you listening to me? The Catholic Church says that no one can be saved unless he or she takes that communion from a Roman Catholic priest. But the fact is, no one should ever partake of communion in this whorish church. The Catholic Church Catechism asserts that one cannot be saved without taking communion in the Catholic Church. But in fact, there is no salvation anywhere in the Catholic Church. If this highness doctrine of transubstantiation were really true, 
That means that every time a person partakes of communion sacraments, he would be literally committing cannibalism by eating the flesh of Christ and drinking his human blood. And they would thereby be crucifying Jesus Christ all over again. Every cent of this lie is patently absurd and is flagrantly offensive to God and all Bible teachings on the matter. And it exposes the real spirit of the Roman Catholic Church wishes to crucify Christ all over again. Why else would anybody perpetually celebrate Christ on the cross? Jesus is not on the cross, and it's high time to stop depicting him on the cross. A much more accurate symbol of true Christianity is not Christ hanging limp and dead on a cross, but the resurrected Christ from an empty tomb. But an even more accurate symbol of Christ's victory over death and hell and the grave is the Holy Ghost in the believers. Rather than carry around a papal staff with Jesus hanging on it, why not practice the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking of the tongues like the early church? That's a living witness of Christ. That communion supper that Jesus gave his disciples was commemorated on the Passover, which is a once-a-year event, first instituted by God himself when Israel escaped bondage in Egypt. And once Jesus conducted communion, he prescribed that from that day forward, every annual Passover communion should be a remembrance of his death, his broken body, and his shed blood at Calvary. A remembrance is a long way from cannibalism. Their cannibalistic exclusivist doctrine of transubstantiation is not a biblical doctrine. It is a raw and grossly objectionable heresy. And there's another sin, another false doctrine of the Catholic Church, and is that false doctrine, that heresy of venial and mortal sins. Venial and mortal sins. The Catholic Church makes a distinction between good sins and bad sins. The Catechism states, Venial sin does not set us in direct opposition to the will and friendship of God. Oh, really? It does not break the covenant with God. Really? Venial sin does not deprive the sinner of sanctifying grace, friendship with God, charity, and consequently eternal happiness. Only if you commit a little sin many times does it then become a mortal sin and has to be repented of or rather confessed to a priest. So there you have it. You can sin without sinning according to the venial sin heresy. You can sin without sinning. You think Jesus believed that? That's taking leave of all rational thought. Sin is sin is sin. How can any sin be sinless? If sin is not sinful, the entire subject is a farce. And that's what they have made sin, a farce. The Bible clearly says that all sin separates a man from God. Read it for yourself in Isaiah 59 too. This lying, deceptive Catholic doctrine justifies sin and leads one to believe that you have no cause to be concerned if you've only committed a venial sin. That is not biblical teaching. A third major heresy of the Catholic Church is that of indulgences. In exchange for donations to the Catholic Church, the priesthood is allegedly able to absolve the donors of their guilt. That allows them to commit adulteries and fornications and any other sin. For a considerable donation to the Catholic Church, your adulteries and fornications and murders and perversions or any other transgressions are said to be absolved. Did you know that's how the Pope raised the money to build St. Peter's Basilica? Millions of dollars in those days were raised to build that basilica by absolving, quote-unquote, the sins of great wealthy men in Europe. It's an abominable heresy. How can any rational person believe that Almighty God endorses such payola, such extortion? All sin must first be thoroughly and sincerely repented of and turned away from. You have to quit your sins. You don't get it absolved by a Catholic priest. Sins are first remitted when they are washed in the blood of Jesus, when we obey the gospel and are water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, according to Acts 2.38, for the remission of sins. That's where the remission of sins comes into place. Remission of sins comes into place when we're water baptized for the first time. 
That's where the blood of Jesus is applied to our sins. Afterwards, after true repentance alone satisfies the grace of God. So if you don't repent, there's no donation the Catholic Church is going to save you. Therefore, if we approach Christ in honest repentance and careful obedience, we have no need of even confessing our sins to Roman Catholic priests. We certainly don't need to pay extortion to have them absolved. This outrageous, abominable, primary Catholic doctrine of indulgences is nowhere to be found anywhere in the Bible, and it clearly demonstrates the Roman Catholic Church proclivities toward avarice, which is greed for riches. Another major heresy of the Catholic Church is confessionals. The Catholic Church teaches people to confess their sins to the priests instead of confessing them to God. I ask you, what kind of extortion or intrigue could you perpetrate if you knew every secret sin of every person in your community? This conniving, intimidating, privacy-invading, primary Catholic doctrine is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It is supremely diabolical. For centuries, duplicitous Jesuits have comprised a majority of confessors History shows that the confessions of Catholics have often been used to manipulate, intimidate, and even extort their parishioners. But let's go to the next big heresy, and that is of purgatory and limbo and prayers for the dead. Jesus taught that when the rich man died, he went immediately to hell, and the righteous man, Lazarus, when he died, went immediately to be with Abraham in the presence of God. But the Catholic Church has created a fantasy world called purgatory or limbo. It's supposed to be a middle place. It's an interim, what is it, a staging area where ungodly souls await their entrance either into heaven or to hell. These are gravely unscriptural beliefs about the destiny of our souls. The Catholic Church teaches that by giving gifts and donations to the Catholic Church, its priests can pray for their unconverted, deceased loved ones to be delivered out of purgatory into the holy presence of Almighty God in heaven, regardless of the sinful lives they lived or what they believed or did in their day. According to the Catholic Church, their freedom and salvation can allegedly be bought by making substantial donations to the Roman Catholic Church. How can anybody, what kind of a stupid person believes that? The blasphemy of this shows the nauseating avarice and the greed that motivates the Catholic Church to take advantage of grieving people. That entire practice is completely absent from the Bible. Nobody in the Bible ever prayed for the dead to be saved after the fact. At best, the Catholic Church is fostering deceptive, misleading, false hope. And at worst, that is responsible for the millions and millions of people being duped into believing that if you're not converted before you die, your relatives can buy your way out of hell. But nothing could be further from the truth. What could be more damnable than to play so recklessly with men's eternal souls? And then there's the heresy of veneration and prayers to the Virgin Mary. Oh, let's get on this one. Solomon asserted that when a man dies, his body returns to the dust. He said, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it in Ecclesiastes 12, 7. So the spirit of a dead person has no awareness of what's going on in earth. He said, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Ecclesiastes 3 and 22. Wherefore, he said, I praise the dead who hath not seen the evil work that's done under the sun. Ecclesiastes 4, 2. That tells us that human spirits are very conscious in heaven or hell, but they're not conscious on earth. He said, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished from the earth, Ecclesiastes 9.5. So what does that mean? That means saints don't hear our prayers. Saints cannot hear our prayers. They're not here. They're gone. 
The righteous men and women who are now ascended in the presence of God in heaven are absolutely oblivious to our activities on earth. They are not bothered with our earthly matters now or ever. So you can grab your prayer beads and say the rosin 10 million times. Say your Hail Marys till you pass out cold on the floor. Mary cannot hear you, but I tell you who does. Familiar spirits, I'm talking about devils, can hear you. And those same kind of evil spirits that the witch of Endor raised up for rebellious King Saul can hear you when you pray. Is that who you want to pray to? You want to pray to those lying devils, those demonic familiar spirits who would absolutely love to ensnare you and have you spend the rest of your days calling on them in prayer instead of God. They've come to steal your affections, to fill your heart and mind with lies, to kill your body and your soul and destroy everything God's ever given you. Those demons yearn to trap you in their hellacious lies and deceptions. Nothing in the Bible remotely suggests that we should pray to the saints. Thus the entire Catholic religious practice of praying to the saints, including the Virgin Mary, and incidentally she's no longer a virgin. That's a pagan, mystical, ultimately demonic practice. It's most certainly not in the Bible. The Pope himself prays to the Virgin. John Paul II credited Mary with saving his life when an assassination tent was made on him. The, this demonic doctrine of Mariology throws the doors wide open for demon spirit and witchcraft to be practiced in the name of Mary. Don't even think of praying to or bowing down before the idols of Mary. God is not okay with demons. That heresy, that Catholic heresy of Mariology, throughout the Roman Catholic Church, Mary is listened to in visions, apparitions, weeping statues, and a growing variety of so-called miraculous revelation. The spirit of Mary is credited with the fall of communism in the Soviet Union, and multitudes of pilgrims travel to places where the Virgin is said to have appeared. There's over 600 cities worldwide in all. But the problem here is that Mary has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. Those are demonic manifestations which delude and deceive everyone who's tricked by them. They're deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils run like the plague from those things. And then idolatry is one of the biggest heresies of Catholicism. Statues and icons by the multitudes play significantly into the Catholic religion. But in the Bible, idolatry is profoundly condemned as one of the most abominable sins anywhere. Yet idols largely define the Catholic Church. They'll swear to you that it's not idolatry, but again, the double speak is absolute denial. The serpent told Adam and Eve, said, you shall not surely die. And today the Catholic Church says, this is not idolatry. Yet it is idolatry. Follow the Roman Catholic holiday parades. Go down to Central America, South America, places all over the world where literally hundreds of thousands of people show up to march these giant idols of Mary through the streets of their cities. Watch them give flowers and other gifts to her and sing and dance to her and kiss her and pray to her. They place idols of Mary in their yards, in their cars, in their bedrooms, on pedestals, everywhere they can find a place to put her. If that's not idolatry, then take the word out of the dictionary. It's meaningless. God destroyed entire nations for idolatry. This doesn't even deserve any further argument. And then there's the heresy of the supreme pontiff, the Pope. According to the Catholic doctrine, the Pope, they call him Papa or Father, is the vicar of Christ, the stand-in for Christ. They call him Holy Father, which directly contradicts Jesus' teaching when he said, Call no man your Father on earth, for one is your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 23, 9. The Pope claims to have the keys to the kingdom of God, which were delivered to Peter by Jesus Christ. He claims apostolic succession to Peter as the first Pope. If this pope is the successor to Peter, why doesn't he preach the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's Acts 2.38. Why doesn't Pope Francis preach that? Yet they claim he's infallible. As the world's biggest perpetrator of false doctrines in the name of Christ, he's a criminal, he's a usurper, he's an imposter, he's a charlatan, a fraud, a ravening wolf in sheep's clothing. There is the Mass. The Catechism teaches that only those who take communion, Eucharist, in the Roman Catholic Church, from a Roman Catholic priest, can be saved. 
since the entire Roman version of the communion is itself a heresy, then this doctrine is intended to force the entire world into heresy and into true denial of the true ordinances of the New Testament church. And then there's the heresy of the rosary. Jesus specifically preached against vain repetitions in prayer. He said, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking, Matthew 6 and 7. Can you tell me what is the point of repeating our fathers 20 million times in one sitting? Nowhere in the Bible is ritualistic praying taught. Hail Marys are based on Elizabeth greeting to Mary, which was not even a prayer in the first place. The Bible doesn't tell us to pray to saints. John showed in the book of Revelation that in heaven, angels and men would rebuke us for venerating or praying to them or bowing down to them. And then the false doctrine, the heresy of infant baptism. This is a bad one, guys. With the introduction of infant baptism, the whole notion of water baptism was severed from a true conversion experience based on repentance. By deviously converting everyone to Roman Catholicism in their infancy, the perceived need for adult baptism has been diabolically subverted. The entire subject of the new birth, according to Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus in John 3, that was extirpated from the true doctrine of salvation. They just took the new birth completely out of the equation. Partaking of the sacraments became the evil Catholic way to salvation. All of it was wickedly designed to prevent the resurgence of the true doctrine of the new birth, of being born again of water and spirit by full immersion in Jesus' name and by the infilling of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as the entire early church did. And the list of heresies, the list of biblical infractions of the Catholic Church could go on and on and on and on. Clearly, the Roman Catholic Church has built a giant pyramid of extra-biblical doctrines that have been drawn in large part from ancient Egyptian and Babylonian mysteries and a variety of pagan mythologies. The devil is a squatter. The devil builds monuments to lies on top of holy sites where truth should be standing. The Roman Catholic Church has for centuries replaced truth with lies and deceptions and created new and false doctrines that have nothing to do with the Bible or eternal salvation. For centuries they stripped the Word of God from their pulpits and absolutely forbade the laity from reading or possessing copies of the Bible on penalty of excommunication and sometimes death. They recited their meaningless masses in the Latin language when almost nobody in the congregation even knew Latin. They facetiously purported that God would miraculously make their hearts understand what was being said. What a Canon 14 of the Catholic Church says, We prohibit that the laity should not be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament. We most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. That was from the Church Council of Toulouse in 1229. The Council of Tarragona of 1234 in its second canon also ruled that no one may possess the books of the Old or New Testaments. And if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days so that they may be burned. That was official Catholic position. Burn the Bibles. Don't let the people have them. Opened on Thursday alongside the Inquisition archives was the infamous Index of Forbidden Books, which Roman Catholics were forbidden to read or possess on pain of excommunication. They showed that even the Bible was once on that blacklist. Translations of the Holy Book ended up on the bonfires along with other so-called heretical works. Their index of forbidden books and all excommunications relating to it were officially abolished in 1966. The Inquisition itself was established by Pope Gregory IX in 1233. He said Vatican archives revealed that the Bible itself was once a banned book. That's according to Jude Weber, a Reuters news article on January of 1998. All of this talk brings up another horror story in the Roman Catholic Church's vile history. Both the Catholic Crusades and the Inquisitions were infamous campaigns 
during which the Roman Catholic Church captured multitudes of people of many nationalities and either forced them to become Catholics or to be persecuted, tortured, or killed. Most historians agree with an estimate that no less than 50 to 60 million people died mercilessly at the hands of militants fighting in behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. Many scholars insist that the figure is closer to 100 million people killed by the Catholic Church. And most of them died because they would not conform to the wishes of the Roman Catholic Church. So you really think this is the church Jesus built? Not on your life. Is this the mother church? Yeah, it's the mother church. It's the mother of harlots. It's the mother of abominations of the earth. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 17, 5. But it is not the mother church of the true church. It's not the mother of the oneness, apostolic, Pentecostal, holiness church of Acts chapter 2. And then there's other grave matters of Catholic mischief called ecumenism or ecumenicalism. As if these errors alone were not enough, the Roman Catholic Church has set out to bring together all the major religions of the world under her umbrella and eventual control. Rome very desperately wants to control all religion, and this is a big deal. According to the Dictionary of Ecumenical Movement, since the Roman Catholic Church convened the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s under Pope Paul VI, the ecumenical intent of the church has been a major thrust. One of the principal motives of Vatican II Council was to recapture all the recalcitrant Catholics and Protestants and many other religions that were considered doctrinally deviant to the Catholic Church and bring them back under the authority and control of the Roman Catholic Church and its pontiff. In doing so, Roman Catholicism has deceptively pretended to allow other religions, even though its official catechism still insists that no one can be saved outside the communion of the Roman Catholic Church. You need not expect that to ever change. In 1302, Pope Boniface VIII said that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. And Vatican II reaffirmed that statement in 1964. You have to be subject to the Pope to be saved, they say. Since the establishment of the Secretariat for Non-Christians, and with the help of the World Council of Churches, the Catholic Church has fostered a new dimension of Hindu-Christian dialogue that has resulted in the growth and spread of Hindu missions in the West. Within the Catholic Church, thousands of priests and nuns now practice yoga and other forms of Hinduism or Buddhism, mysticism. One keen example is at the College of St. Mary in Omaha, Nebraska, where Sister Mary O'Hara, professor of philosophy, taught Buddhist and Hindu techniques for enhancing education in Catholic schools. And now you see yoga being taught in, in evangelical churches, and all that sprang from the Catholic Church. Pertaining to Islam, the Muslim faith, Pope John Paul II greeted a crowd of Muslims in Brussels, Belgium, and said, Christians and Muslims, we meet one another with one faith in one God and try to put into practice the teachings of our respective holy books. And now we've seen Pope Francis making the same kind of overtures with Muslims all over the world in recent years. The outrageous crime of such position is that no true Christian could ever agree that the God of Islam is the same God of the Bible, nor can any true Christian commend the teachings of the Quran. You can't commend the teachings of the Quran. The Catholic Church is increasingly intertwined with all kinds of heathen and pagan religions. In New York City in St. Patrick's Cathedral, Cardinal Cook received the Dalai Lama, who claimed to be the 14th reincarnation of the first Buddha. The Cardinal said, all the world's religions are basically the same. What a liar. He called the event one of the greatest movements of the Spirit in our time. Well, it may have been a movement of the Spirit, but it was not the Holy Spirit. In December 2014, Pope Francis met in Sri Lanka with world religious leaders from Shia and Sunni Islam and with Hindus and Buddhists and Anglicans and Jews and Orthodox and other kind of Christian communities. 
It's a story that's bigger than you can imagine. The Catholic Church lusts madly to preside over all the world's religions. Kenneth Copeland, all the big name evangelicals have kissed the Pope's ring or they visited the, in the Vatican and they've all pledged their love and support for the Roman Catholic Church. You can believe that this strategy is never going to end until Jesus comes. But you might say, what does the Roman Catholic Church have to do with me? Here's what it has to do with you. The Catholic Church is after Pentecostals too. For all of its determination to fuse the world's religions together under the umbrella of the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church has an unofficially declared holy war in places like Brazil against fundamentalist Christians, especially Pentecostal Christians. It is not just a regional war, but it's a global war. The Catholic liberation theology is a form of Catholic communism that's literally invading the world. Liberation theologians are communist Catholics, and they are multiplying like killer bees throughout the world in Central and South America, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and yes, even in the United States. Do you not realize that a big part of the radical left, socialist, communist part in this country sprang from Roman Catholicism. In Nicaragua, Ronald Reagan and Oliver North sided with the Contras in their war against the Sandinistas, who were Catholic communists, who taught and still teach that Jesus was the first communist revolutionary. Sandinista propaganda artwork in that part of the world depicts Jesus with an assault weapon. In places like Guatemala, a veritable holy war has been fought between Catholics and evangelicals. Thousands have been persecuted and killed, and evangelical-leaning government was blackballed and overthrown by the Catholic communists. In Washington, D.C., liberation theologians lobby extensively in the U.S. Congress for legislation that presses for pro-Catholic ecumenical religion worldwide, while at the same time strips religious freedoms from the little guys like evangelicals and fundamentalists. The massive socialist revolution that's taking place in the United States right now is fueled in large part by activist Catholics. A vastly disproportionate number of politicians and media personalities are members of the Roman Catholic Church. Just go to the White House or go to the Supreme Court or go to the Congress halls. You're going to see Catholics, 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 Catholics everywhere. Not the least of which is John Roberts' Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who's very much an activist Roman Catholic. An extremely high percentage of the so-called conservatives that we see on network news channels, despite all their right-wing rhetoric, are Roman Catholics. Just name, them, name about half of all the celebrities on Fox News are Roman Catholics. They're doing precious little to actually turn the tides from extreme left-wing liberalism. Instead, they demand a fair and balanced mix that almost always gives equal time to the socialist commentary. Before Donald Trump was elected, few people even believed that there was any substantial ideological difference between the right and the left in this country. Both sides were filled with radical New World Order socialists and spurred constantly by Catholic ideologues. Thankfully, we now see a significant difference forming between the right and the left in America. But it's important for you to realize that the immigration nightmare in this country has been provoked and legally defended by the Roman Catholic Church. This, this border crisis that we have is fomented in large part by the Roman Catholic Church. A massive influx of illegal aliens has been granted amnesty by the liberal left-leaning governments and the numbers of Spanish Catholics and other Illegal alien voters in America have multiplied by millions because of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church loves that. The fact is that it was the many centuries of Roman Catholic abominations that provoked the Protestant Reformation. Did you hear me? It was the many centuries of Roman Catholic abominations that caused the Protestant Reformation that began in the early 1500s. Martin Luther left the Catholic Church for 95 reasons that were no different from the kind of offenses I'm talking about today. Lutherans and Calvinists and Anabaptists and countless other Protestants and Reformers revolted against the universally corrupt Roman Catholic Church. But the historic Reformation of earlier centuries has now been renounced 
and it's been overturned. In our time, the Reformation has been overturned by evangelicals, modern evangelicals who've been totally duped by the Catholic Church propaganda machine. Listen, on March the 30th, 1994, the New York Times reported that the most significant event in 500 years of Catholic and evangelical relations took place. It called, it said, in what's being called a historic declaration, evangelicals, including Pat Robertson and Charles Colson, one of the chief originators, joined with the conservative Roman Catholic leaders today in upholding the ties of faith that binds the nation's largest and most politically active religious groups. They urge Catholics and evangelicals to stop aggressively proselyting each other's flocks. John White, president of Geneva College and former president of the National Association of Evangelicals, said the statement represents a triumphalistic moment in American religious life after centuries of distrust. Other evangelical endorsers included heads of the Home Mission Board and Christian Life Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, who acted in an independent capacity, the nation's largest Protestant denomination, and Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, Mark Knoll of Wheaton University, Oz Guinness, Jesse Miranda of the Assemblies of God, Richard Mal, president of Fuller Theological Seminary, and others. These evangelicals said there's no longer any difference. We're not protesting the Catholic Church anymore. I've heard Paul Crouch of the Trinity Broadcasting say we're not protesting anything anymore. They applaud the declaration and said that they hoped it would bring increased cooperation between evangelicals and Catholics. I'm telling you the old reformers would turn over in their graves because they called the Catholic Church the Antichrist. But now the new Christians call it the Mother Church. And that points us back to the early days of the Mother Catholic Church Reminding us again of the real root of the problem. Historically, Rome itself was a ruthless, vicious enemy of Christianity. Millions of early church saints were killed by the powers of the Roman Empire. But Rome usurped the true church in a coup d'etat and created the Roman Catholic Church, now known as the Great Whore. But now the bulk of evangelicals of our time are turning the entire Protestant movement around and headed back to the Roman Catholic Church. Christian fundamentalism has now retrogressed into a Catholic-friendly ecumenical movement. I fully expect to see virtually all evangelical Protestants returning to their mother, the Roman Catholic Church, because the fact is they never really left it. Their baptism has always been the Roman Catholic baptism, and it was never the true biblical baptism. In five centuries of Protestantism, they never corrected the blasphemous Trinitarian doctrine. They never truly protested the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, the conclusion is inescapable and undeniable. They are still the harlot daughters of the mother whore that John saw in Revelation 17. Is the Roman Catholic Church the repository of the spirit of truth? Absolutely not. Is there a spirit in the Catholic Church? Yes, but it is not the spirit of God. And if it is not, then it must be a demon. And it is. The Catholic Church is indeed full of evil spirits. In Revelation 17, when John saw the woman clothed in scarlet and purple with the golden cup in her hand, he certainly saw prophetically the coming Roman Catholic Church hundreds of years before it existed. But there was one more thing he saw that was very intriguing. He said, I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns in Revelation 17:3. I don't have the time or space here to get into the full explanation of all that, but I urge you to get my book, The Daniel Prophecies, and also this book, The Great Doctrine of the Bible. They both explain all this in great detail, but I will tell you here and now about what this particular prophecy was all about. The woman riding that scarlet beast is specifically the Roman Catholic Church. She is the Jesuit-driven, Marxist, socialist, liberation theology teaching Roman Catholic Church who has fornicated and continues to fornicate politically and financially and spiritually with all the kings of the earth. The scarlet colored beast in this verse upon which the woman the great horse sits is the red socialist communist new world order. It is the European based world government that's coming in the last days. I've carefully explained all about that in my book the Daniel Prophecies. But to be as brief as concise as I can I'll tell you in a nutshell this prophecy describes the Roman Catholic Church writing the last socialist communist world government. 
before Jesus Christ returns to rage war against it as the great and final battle of Armageddon. The Bible says the Catholic Church will ride a scarlet beast. The woman, the great whore, rides the beast of socialism and communism until Jesus comes. When you see the Pope of the Catholic Church standing in the United Nations General Assembly addressing kings and presidents and prime ministers, sheiks and princes of the world, you're getting a strong foretaste of what it means for the woman to ride the scarlet-colored beast. Whereas the Catholic Church already has an utterly enormous influence in the United Nations, the prophecies of the Bible tell us that the world government body will soon shift its power base to Europe where the Roman Catholic Church will wield even more influence over kings of the earth. Throughout its evil history, the Catholic Church has conducted various kinds of inquisitions, brutally and mercilessly torturing and murdering its opponents in nations around the world. For over a thousand years, more than 75 popes ordered the wholesale slaughter of no less than 8 million non-Catholics for heresies, refusal, convert to Catholic Church. Many believe the numbers are more accurately around 50 or 60 million dead, maybe even as high as 125 million. I don't have the time or space to treat this topic here, but do a web search on inquisitions and then you sit back and fasten your seatbelt because it's appalling how sinister and demonic this so-called church is. There is no way on earth I could ever call anything about the Roman Catholic Church holy. Lucifer dwells in the heart and soul of this organization. The Catholic Church has been a powerful driving force in the evolution and the rising of the despotic New World Order and the world government, not to mention the cold-blooded murder of all true biblical Christianity in its day. But most importantly, Almighty God has plans for its total annihilation. The prophecies say that the New World Order will finally rise up against the Catholic Church and destroy it, and then Jesus himself will tend to casting the Pope into the lake of fire at the Battle of Armageddon. Again. The Bible says the ten horns, which are ten kings in that final world government, which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put into their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, speaking of Rome, which reigns over the kings of the earth, Revelation 17. The Pope is the false prophet of Revelation 13. He will be destroyed at Armageddon by Jesus Christ along with the other world government beasts. Carefully read Revelation 18 verse 1 through 19 and you'll see the dramatic fall of Mystery Babylon. That will be the demise of the Roman Catholic Church and all her colleagues, ultimately including the New World Order. And you and I will live to see it happen with our own eyes. So why have I taken so much time today to go to such great length and detail about the Roman Catholic Church in this video? And the subject of this video is the greatest doctrines of the Bible, so why? Because I believe with all my heart and soul that you and I will soon face, you and I will soon face the wrath of the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation 13 tells us explicitly that the false prophet pope of the Roman Catholic Church will introduce the mark of the beast in the last days the Pope will be complicit with the New World Order to silence or destroy all people and movements that are not in total compliance with their Luciferic agenda for the last days. Therefore, I have done my best here to educate you about these epic powers that be. It is no coincidence that the very same entity, the Roman Catholic Church, that overthrew the early church and murdered off the great body of oneness apostolic Pentecostal believers in the early church through the centuries, and who supplanted the true church with false Trinitarian doctrine for 2,000 years and a false meaningless baptism, is now also the driving force behind the coming new world order, behind the mark of the beast and the great tribulation of Matthew 24. False religion is one of the greatest jeopardies of your soul. More people will go to hell because they were trapped in a false religion than will go to heaven because they found true religion. Do not think that false religion is no hazard to you or to your loved ones. Anyone who truly desires to be saved should heed this admonition of Revelation 18.4. He said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. According to these verses, you will be guilty by association if you refuse to separate yourself from all false religion. You will be condemned and judged just like that false church. 
So you must renounce, you must denounce Trinitarianism, the religion of the great whore, Roman Catholic Church, and all of its Protestant harlot daughters. The true plan of salvation is nowhere to be found in the Trinitarian mystical Babylon environment. It is found in the oneness apostolic, Acts 2.38, Pentecostal holiness gospel message. Every true believer must repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and be baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues as the early church did. Jesus said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He's talking about the doctrine of Christ, the truth of the oneness of God and the new birth. You and I are going to have to preach the truth if we want to be saved. We're going to have to reject all false doctrines. The true church is not built on Peter or the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. It's built on the revelation of the oneness of God in Christ, not the heretical trinity of Catholicism. I'm telling you today, you better believe the truth in Jesus' name. And that's my message to you today. I thank you so much for being with me. This has been a longer than usual message, but you need to hear it. And I hope you have heard it, and I hope you will believe it, and you will respond accordingly. I hope you'll follow me on all my social networks, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the notification bell so you receive notices each time. Also, please go to Amazon, Amazon.com and search for books by Ken Raggio, books by Ken Raggio. Look up all these books. I hope you'll get this book, The Daniel Prophecies, also this book, The Greatest Doctrines of the Bible, The Oneness of God and the New Birth. You need to read this. You need to read both these books. They'll enlighten you. They'll show you things you probably never knew, and it'll change your life, I promise you. Also, if you can support this effort here, uh, if you can make a donation to Ken Raggio, please check out the link below this video. There's an online uh, means to do that, and there's also an address you can send a, a donation or a gift to. Also, if you are interested to go with me to Israel, uh, try to host a, an annual trip to the Holy Land as well as an annual prophecy cruise. Check out all the information in the links below here. Thanks again for joining me. Please join me every Monday night and Thursday night here on Facebook Live, and I'll see you next time. God bless you. Thank you.